Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Singer from the Kellogg Hubbard Library, I'm the Adult Programs and Outreach Coordinator. It's so nice to be together tonight. Um, we are having a lovely um, program tonight and discussion. We are going to start by um, having a discussion and inviting program, uh, inviting questions on the chat. So if you haven't done chat before, if you go to the bottom of your screen and hover over um, a menu should come up and there's a little uh, word bubble and that's chat and you push on that and it brings up a dialog box and you can type in questions there um, that we can pitch to Alan at the end of his talk. So please do put your questions there for, for the Q&A after. after. When we're done and we, we finish those questions, uh, we, can, we can open up to, to live questions. I am recording this program and it will be available on the Kellogg Hubbard Library's YouTube channel. It's also going to be used in uh, Rick Agron's WGDR radio program, Bon Mott. He does that program on 91.9 FM on Sunday evenings from 5 to 6.30 PM. And I'm not sure which uh, Sunday he's going to air some of this program, but that is his plan. And you can also catch his, um, they also store it on their website, WGDR.org. So either on the library's YouTube or with WGDR. So without further ado, we are very happy to welcome Alan Gilbert. He will be reading from his book, Equal is Equal, Fair is Fair. The book is about Vermont's quest for equality in education funding, same-sex marriage, and healthcare, all naughty issues the state has grappled with over many years. Alan Gilbert is a former journalist, teacher, VPR commentator, and ACLU Vermont as executive director. We'll hand it over to you, Alan, and thanks so much for being here tonight. Michelle, thanks very much. I'm grateful to the library for setting this up and inviting people to come. This is this is really great. <clears throat> so you've you've sort of said a bit about uh, me, and people probably have a pretty good hint of how I got interested in this whole subject of of um, uh, people's individual rights in uh, the three cases that I talk about, or the three third one's not a case. The three issues that I talk about in the book are uh, school funding, <clears throat> the Brigham decision, um, the Baker decision, which led to equal marriage rights. And then the third issue I, I tackle is health care. And in the first of the two issues in school funding and in, <clears throat> excuse me, marriage rights, there were successful uh, lawsuits, litigation that brought on changes, really pretty dramatic changes in both of those areas. But healthcare has been the outlier. It's been uh, actually a much longer campaign of reform than either, uh, than either of the other two were. And for some reason, we've not been able to make the kind of progress to getting towards equity in healthcare, access to healthcare, that we have in the areas of public school funding and marriage rights. <clears throat> and the question for me when I started the book was, why is that the case? And I think I came up with some ideas, but every time I, I talk about this book, I probably get more questions about healthcare uh, than any of the other areas. And it's pretty obvious why healthcare affects everybody. And we're all pretty darn mad about the fact the state has not been able to carry through and promises it's made to create a un universal access <clears throat> uh, publicly financed system. So it's uh, that's been very frustrating, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I really, I really have to start with trying to explain some, some stuff about why this all came about in Vermont. You know, why, why is it that Vermont um, <clears throat> had this legal decision in the case of school funding that led to, <clears throat> according to a good many uh, education specialists, the fairest uh, school funding system in the country? How is it that Vermont became the first state to have a, a court rule that gay couples had the same rights to marriage benefits as straight couples. Um, and what, what's, in, what's in the water in Vermont that, that this stuff is happening? 
And there are, two, there are two reasons. One is there are people here in the state who are committed to certain issues and are willing to put in a lot of time and energy, and in some cases money, to try to get the kind of result that they think is fair to the citizens of the state. The other reason though, <clears throat> and it's the one that <clears throat> I think it really is accurate to say that Vermont is Vermont is, is special in this regard. Vermont has a couple of things in its state constitution that are rather unusual. And it also, it ha has a constitution, our state constitution has been the least amended of all the state constitutions around the country. So what's happened is we've ended up with language in our co state constitution that really comes from things that were written uh, more than 200 years ago, more like 250 years ago. And one of those rights especially was one that was written <clears throat> Um, and was put into the Pennsylvania Constitution. It was actually written by James Mason in Virginia. It was part of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which actually preceded any of the state constitutions that were developed, but a lot of people copied things from the Declaration of Rights. Pennsylvania Constitution did that. It said that when government provides a benefit, it called it a common benefit, it has to be provided to people on an equal basis. And the idea was that there was to be no special favors given to people uh, under the kind of democratic government that the colonists were hoping to set up in each of their states. <clears throat> the language of that common benefits protection is actually still almost word for word <clears throat> the language that James Mason used when he wrote that. And I think it was 1775 that the Declaration of Rights in Virginia was written by Mason. And when it went into our constitution, there have only been some very small changes to it. One, one is to change the language uh, from, it talks about this right being gar guaranteed to all men. And that was changed about uh, uh, 15 years ago to be gender neutral. So it's now to all people. Otherwise the language is still the same as it was um, 250 years ago. And that makes the Vermont right to have equal access to things the government provides different than what most states have because most states rely on the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution, which was adopted after the Civil War. It's the amendment that is usually called the Equal Protection Amendment. <clears throat> and it basically said, and this is in the context of providing uh, equal rights for for formerly enslaved black people. It said that nobody can be discriminated against uh, on the basis of race uh, or of um, historical background. I, I forget the exact language, but it doesn't use the same language that the Vermont Protection of Common Benefits does. So when uh, in the 19, late, 80s, late 80s and early 1900s, I'm sorry, early 2000s, no, it was 19, I'm sorry, I'm getting my centuries confused. In the early 1990s, when people were <clears throat> getting frustrated with the legislature not being able to figure out how to change school funding uh, to make it more equitable so all towns would have an equal draw on school resources, they could, they could all have the same access to resources. People looked to the uh, Vermont Constitution uh, at this common benefits clause and people decided uh, there was a team of lawyers put together uh, led by the American Civil Liberties Union. Bob Gensberg uh, <clears throat> uh, of the St. Johnsbury area, he was, he was an attorney in, in St. Jay. Uh, he, was, he volunteered to be the lead attorney and they put together a lawsuit, uh, the Brigham lawsuit, that was the lawsuit that eventually led to the changing of the school funding formula. Let me just read a couple of things to sort of set the, set the tone for, for what I'm trying to explain. Uh, I write in my book, and it's, it's in the introduction actually, in this country and particularly in Vermont, we're constantly challenged to think not just of our own good, but of the common good as well. Sometimes we shine at this task, 
Other times we create a muddled mess. There's no guarantee that fairness, equity, and equality will win out. Even when they do, there's no guarantee that the victories will be permanent. But surrounding us like a cultural cocoon is our shared history. The Vermont Supreme Court's opinion in the Baker case, that was the uh, gay marriage case, describes long chains of beliefs, actions, and interrelationships that have placed us where we are and provided us with the knowledge and skills which we <clears throat> use to take on life's responsibilities, including civic responsibilities, and as a state pursue the interests we hope will bring us happiness. Within Vermont's constitutional framework lies a firm commitment to community and fairness. As I said before, Vermont is still governed by progressive language on individual rights that were written in the immediate afterglow of the colony's break with Great Britain. The Vermont Constitution is the least amended of any state constitution in the country. Before I go any further with this, I've already used the word equity and equality. Um, and I wanted to, to, to explain how I think these two words different are, are, are different, they mean different things, uh, and why we should be careful to use them in the ways that I think are consistent with, with what they're really meant to do. Equity is really a, um, a principle and it's a process. It's something, it's a circumstance that you create in order for people to have equal access uh, to skills, to uh, uh, money possibly. In the case of the Brigham decision, it was equal access to school opportunities. Equality on the other end is really a result. It's not a process. It's not a principle. Well, it can be a principle, but it's really a result of having equity that allows people to have the same access to resources that other people have. And the hope is that on the other end, the result is people who are more equal in the skills they have, uh, in the things they can do, in the ways they're accepted. And what Vermont has pledged itself to do by setting up its common benefits clause the way it has, is it said that we as a state have a responsibility to make sure on the, on the process end of things, um, on the principled end of things, we're going to create as much uh, equity in people accessing the benefits that we as a society, as a government, provide to our citizens. And that's, that's, that's a very, very specific goal. And it's a little bit different. In fact, it's a lot different from equality. But I think oftentimes the words are used interchangeably and they're really not that. And when you think about it, um, it's, it's hard to say how you create equality without first thinking how are you, what are you going to do to try to make equality happen? Which is, really, which is really the issue when you're trying to reach equality. You're trying to figure out what are the circumstances that are necessary for people to have an equal chance to succeed. One of the things that I thought I'd do is, uh, again, there are three chapters in the book about ed funding, about gay marriage and about uh, healthcare. And, each one of them begins with a story, uh, a profile of somebody who was involved <clears throat> in one of these issues. Um, and the, the one that's kind of my favorite is the one in the first chapter, the school funding uh, chapter, because I write about Amanda Brigham. Um, you're going to hear all about Amanda Brigham. She really was a person and she's still around. And I thought that she, in many ways, spoke, even though she was an eight-year-old child when the Brigham case was filed, she was somehow somehow a, a, um, a person who, for me, uh, brought together all the things that were necessary uh, when the lawsuit was filed to try and make education funding more fair. So let me, it's, this is about four minutes, so let me, I'll read this through. Behind every legal case is a person and a story. The school funding case filed in 1995 in Vermont Superior Court in Hyde Park 
was Brigham v. State of Vermont. Although there were 13 plaintiffs, the lead plaintiff was Amanda Brigham. Her surname came first alphabetically in the list of plaintiffs, and so the file created by the court was Brigham. I always felt it was fitting that a lawsuit that broke new legal ground in an important education issue took the name of an eight-year-old. Once the Supreme, Vermont Supreme Court decision in the case was handed down two years later, legislators explaining a school funding issue began to say that Brigham requires this or Brigham doesn't allow that. I smile to think how appropriate it was that a child from a rural Addison County farm town seemed to be telling adults what to do when it came to education. Amanda was the daughter of Carol and Rusty Brigham of Whiting, a hardworking couple who struggled to keep the family farm going, but who ended up having to work off the farm as well to make ends meet. Carol served on the Whiting School Board. She knew how hard it was to balance the school's budget. The town was property poor and residents' incomes were below the state average. There was nothing fancy about the small school in the village that served kids in kindergarten through sixth grade. Amanda was squirming in a decidedly adult-sized chair when I met her in the summer of 1995 at the Lamoille County Courthouse. Her mother introduced us, explaining that my school was also involved in the lawsuit. We were a plaintiff like her. Amanda said, hello, after prompting from her mom. Carol whispered to me that she was shy. I tried to put myself in her shoes, pondering what it would be like if my mother and I had one day gotten into our car and driven 85 miles from the small town where I was growing up to attend something called a hearing to change things so schools work better for all kids. It's hard to know how much any eight-year-old can understand of a complicated legal case. There was something about the way Amanda squirmed that late summer day though, her feet unable to touch the courthouse's wooden floor, but her eyes roaming the school-like room with the judge's bench, the lawyer's tables and rows of seats. Something told me she may not now understand what was happening, but that at some point in the future, she would. She'd know she was part of his, <clears throat> she'd know she was part of history that day. As Amanda grew older, so did her confidence. After elementary school in Whiting, she went to the regional high school in Brandon and then out of state for college. Carol and I would often meet at state education functions <clears throat> and she would update me on what Amanda was doing. I felt immensely proud when Amanda gained bachelor's and master's degrees in sports management, worked at universities in Pennsylvania, New York, and then returned to Vermont for a job at Norwich University. She and her husband bought their first home in Northfield and by 2017, she had become an aunt. When I retired from the ACLU in 2016, Amanda and her mom drove from Whiting to Montpelier for my going away party. I get it now, her smile <clears throat> said to me when, she when we reminisced about the lawsuit and her role in it. Looking back to our first meeting at the Memorial County Courthouse, it seems like Amanda's involvement in the lawsuit was destiny. For the Brigham family's dedication to equity is generational. Her mother served on school boards for 24 years and has remained one of the fiercest defenders of student equity in Vermont. Carol Brigham's dad was a school board member for nine years and a lister for 18. His biggest concern as a lister was tax equity. It's not easy being a plaintiff in a lawsuit. Amanda has never worn, worn on her sleeve the notoriety awarded by the alphabet. Her shyness long ago gave way to a proud modesty of a young woman whose school needed help. Those were, I didn't have introductions like that originally in my book, but an editor I was working with thought that it would be good to have some, some real human faces described. And he was absolutely right. Um, Profiling somebody like that uh, was challenging, but when when I when I finally got the gist of it, um, it became one of my favorite parts of the book, and I'm I'm re I'm really glad that he made that suggestion for me.
I don't want to bore you too much with details about the common benefits clause because it, it really in the book it, it's I think it's explained very easily and smoothly. When you try to put all this into a 15 minute presentation, I feel like I'm really scrunching stuff up and maybe making it more difficult to understand that it really is. But let me read you a few things from the decision in um, the Brigham case. Um, and then I'll also read some of the language from the Baker case, because despite the fact that probably very few people read lawsuits and think that they're overly complicated, these two particular lawsuits, the opinions in them are pretty straightforward. And they're, they're actually, to my mind, dramatically straightforward and uh, effective. So for example, when the Vermont Supreme Court decided the Brigham case, it said in its decision, because of the common benefits clause and because the state is required to provide education, the distribution of a resource, this is from the decision, as precious as educational opportunity may not have as its determining force, the mere fortuity of a child's residence. It requires no particular constitutional expertise to recognize the capriciousness of such a system. And then I said in the book, the court set a baseline, a mandate that said, and this quotes from the decision, children who live in property poor districts and children who live in property rich districts should be afforded a substantially equal opportunity to have access to similar educational revenues. Pretty straightforward. And that was exactly where the legislature start, started once the decision was handed down in molding Act 60. And to this day, Act 60, uh, the funding formula still works exactly the way the Supreme Court said that it had to. In the Baker case, which involved gay marriage, um, it's a little bit different from the Brigham case in that not only did the court uh, look at the issue of gay marriage rights, and it said under the Common Benefits Clause that gay couples were entitled to the same benefits as straight couples were. But the other thing the court did in the Baker case was to have basically a long discussion about how the Common Benefits Clause should be applied going forward to other issues besides these two that it had already been used on. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to spend a bit more time on this is that when people talk about healthcare and how do we move healthcare reform forward, one of the things you have to realize is that healthcare is in a very different position than school funding or gay marriage was because the government, as hard as it, it's, gonna, it's gonna seem to believe this, the government in the case of healthcare is not offering a benefit. It's not paying for healthcare for everybody or for certain people and not others. In the other cases, it was very clear that some schools were being shortchanged because of the tax system for gay marriage. Uh, you couldn't do it if you were gay. There was clear discrimination and a benefit that the government could bestow on people was not being bestowed on certain people. And there was no, um, no legal reason why that was the case in the court. In these two cases, Baker and Brigham said, they identified that and said, yes. But the question then became, well, what's gonna happen going forward? How is this, how is this going to be, how are we going to make a decision and what happened was uh, the, the opinion in, in the, the uh, Baker case was written by the new chief uh, justice at the time, Jeffrey Amistoy. He had been our state, the, uh, the uh, attorney general in the state for uh, a long time and he was reelected six times. Um, and he was appointed the uh, chief justice of the Vermont Supreme Court in 1996. So 
he came on uh, right as these two cases were coming through the system. He actually didn't participate in the school case, but he did in the Baker case. And he just happened to be the one who drew the straw for writing the unanimous uh, uh, decision in that case. And he felt that it was very important to try to try to set a pattern for how using this common benefits clause, how that could be applied to other issues. And what he did was a long historical analysis that, that, that's, that's if, if you're a historian, which actually um, uh, he, he was as well as being an attorney, um, Amistory tried to understand how the common benefits clause had been written 250 years ago and what people might have been thinking, how broad a protection it provided. And so he just delved into a lot of history books and came up with a lot of interesting stuff. Let me read a little bit from the book. <clears throat> the affirmative right to the common benefits and protections of government and the corollary prescription of favoritism in the distribution of public emoluments and advantages reflect the framers overarching objective, not only that everyone enjoy equality before the law or have an equal voice in government, but also that everyone have an equal share in the fruits of the common enterprise. And again, this is Justice Amistory. Thus, at its core, the Common Benefits Clause expressed a vision of government that afforded every Vermonter its benefit and protection and provided no Vermonter particular advantage. And here's how Amistory wrote, we could determine if a common benefit has been denied. We must alternately ascertain whether the omission of a part of the community from the benefit, protection, and security of the challenge law bears a reasonable and just relation to the governmental purpose. Consistent with the core presumption of inclusion, factors to be considered in this determination may include the significance of the benefits and protections of the challenge law, number two, whether the omission of members of the community from the benefits and protections of the challenge law promotes the government's stated goals, and three, whether the classification is significantly under-inclusive or over-inclusive. And granted, Amistory was admitting this wasn't easy. He went on to say, the balance between individual liberty and organized society, which courts are continually called upon to weigh, does not lend itself to the precision of a scale. It is indeed a recognition of the, imp the imprecision of reason judgment that compels both judicial restraint and respect for tradition and constitutional interpretation. So what I was story was doing was he was seeking this longer vision, this, this he's calling it a pragmatic constitutionalism about how we as Vermonters could use, best use the equity protection of the common benefits clause. And I wrote that Amistory suggested in comments he made later in a law review article, the Baker decision reflected what he thought of as dramatic constitutionalism. As an analogy of what courts must sometimes do, Amistory talked of building a house and having to modify it from time to time to suit the needs of its inhabitants. Amistory really did appeal to our common humanity. He wrote, whatever Baker's ultimate fate as a statement of independent state constitutional jurisprudence, the experience of the Vermont community in responding to the opinion does demonstrate, I believe, that by conscious choice of language and analytical structure, a state appellate court may either arrest or advance the public debate, even in such highly charged issues as same-sex marriage. And he went on to make it a bit more easy to understand what he was saying. In concluding that extending the benefits of protections, the benefits and protections of marriage to the plaintiffs was simply when all is said and done, a recognition of our common humanity. The Baker opinion was intended to resonate with every Vermonter for in our constitutional system, every Vermonter is a participant and we all live in the same house. We will know we have built well when in the words of the poet, quote, underneath that roof, there was no distinction of persons, 
but one family only, one heart, one hearth, and one household. <clears throat> now, if you're an English major, you might recognize what, what that's from. That's actually from <clears throat> uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's uh, Tales of a Wayside Inn. It's the, from the theologian's tale, but it's just this marvelous language that the <clears throat> Chief Justice was using to basically say, we're all in this together, we're all one family. When we rebuild something, we do it knowing that we all live, down, live under the same roof. So when I finish my section on the Baker, the Baker issue, I, I sort of concluded it. Um, and I actually was thinking of the next chapter I had to write when I did this because I knew the healthcare, was, the healthcare issue was gonna be a more difficult one to try and get my hands around. But I wrote the real achievement of the Baker decision and what Amistoy was saying, maybe to show Vermonters that the state's common benefits clause is based on enlightened thinking from 250 years ago. And that the clause really does mean that the benefits society offers its citizens must be provided on an equal basis. Just because a benefit or right isn't specifically mentioned in the state constitution doesn't mean it's disqualified for a review under the state's common benefits clause. Such an approach would be radical, which perhaps is precisely what the state's founders hoped the common benefits clause would encourage and what Amistory felt it should with the court's help. Using the common benefits clause to create such equity might not be easy, but perhaps the full bravery of the Baker decision and of the common benefits clause is yet to be tapped. And that brings us to healthcare. Um, it, one, one thing that I realized when I started researching the healthcare issue was that it goes back more than a hundred years. Uh, it started in the late 19, 1910s, 19 teens. Um, as early as 1920, there were uh, efforts being made to try and get the state to provide some sort of medical care uh, to people around Vermont. And the fight over what Vermont should do has been going on ever since. And if you've been around Vermont since the, especially the, the um, 1990s on, uh, some, Madeline Cunin did some things in the 80s, but it was really the, the 1990s and the early 2000s when Vermont really tried to, to take on the challenge of how, how, how the state could set up a universal publicly, access, a publicly financed uh, healthcare system. And unfortunately, the chapter is all about how we have not been able to achieve that. There have been some really impressive advances, but twice, uh, once under Howard Dean, when he was proposing and the legislature was moving through a very broad reform plan, um, he gave up because he became convinced that the money wasn't there and the legislative support wasn't there. And then uh, 20 years later, the same happened with uh, Peter Shumlin uh, when he too was trying to uh, push forward a 20 years ago, I'm sorry, I'm, it's 10, 10 years later. He was trying to put forward um, a health reform plan and he also gave up despite a lot of work and a lot of attention from the legislature going into trying to build a system. So whenever I'm, whenever I'm asked what can be done to do the same thing for healthcare that was done for school funding and gay rights, I say, it's a real challenge. I'm not convinced that a lawsuit could not be brought a successful one because I think the common benefits clause is as broad as um, Amistoy was hinting it, it, it could be. I think the major problems right now are, we really don't have the energy of a governor behind healthcare reform. I don't think we have the attention of the legislature for healthcare reform. And I'm frankly not sure how our Supreme Court would handle a common benefits claim working towards trying to set up a universal uh, publicly financed healthcare system. It would, it, it would be a real uphill slog 
And I think that's the reason why nobody has tried, tried the, to file a lawsuit to challenge what the state's been doing. It just is a very different ball of wax that um, we've been dealing with. The people who provide healthcare are not the government or you know, private entities or public nonprofits. Um, and the whole money system behind it is some of it is government money, but most of it is, is our premiums. So it's, it's a different situation. It's not as public a program as the other two things that I talk about in my book. So let me stop. I, I've, I've probably poured too much, too much into your ears already. And I'd be happy to see what questions might be in the chat. And then if there aren't any or, or there aren't very many, we can just open up the floor to general discussion. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat yet. I think people are probably just listening in. Does um, people can unmute themselves at this point and hop in and ask a question if they like? And I know several people I could ask questions of if they don't uh, <laughs> if they don't speak up. Yeah, go ahead, Deborah. Um, hi, Alan. I um, hi, was wondering how can we get a copy of your book. Oh, uh, it's pretty easy. You can get it if you can get it at your local bookstore. The easiest way to figure out the easiest way to get it from the local bookstore and who your local bookstore might be. I, I set up a website for the book. It's called equalisequal.com. And I actually made a list of all the bookstores uh, that were operating in Vermont, uh, at least at the beginning of the pandemic. Let me let me throw that out there. And I and I write how people can either buy the book uh, in the store or they can uh, often through the store, buy the book online. And the reason this is such a long soliloquy on how can you get the book is I'm trying to encourage uh, people to buy the book uh, from local stores or through local stores as much as possible. But you obviously can also get the book uh, by going online to Amazon. And there's even a, uh, <clears throat> there's even a Kindle version uh, that's available if you wanna get that. Okay, and I had another um, comment I wanted to make. I live in Bristol, yep. and um, the local Bristol um, Democratic Town Committee has been working really hard um, to promote um, primary care, universal primary care. And I have sort of was involved in that back in the 80s, and I'm not, I don't have the same energy they do now, but, um, but, one of our senators, Chris Bray, is going to propose um, legislation um, in the next, in this coming up um, session about universal primary care. Do you, do you have contact with him at all? Well, I know who he is. And when I was, you know, uh, lobbying in the legislature for the ACLU, I, I, I talked with Chris quite a bit. Uh, he's, a, he's a good person to, to work with, that's for sure. Um, you know, I don't know, one, one of the things that's going to be hard, especially this coming year in the legislature is it's, they've really got to reorganize so many committees because there's been so much turnover and they lost so much institutional knowledge, uh, because of the turnover that I think it's going to take them a couple of months just to get settled and get committees going and start doing this work. And healthcare is is one of those things that it it, it is not an easy subject. It, it 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 requires it requires a sharp mind, but it also requires a terrific capacity to be able to quickly understand how not just the healthcare system itself works, you know, the the, the provision of care, but how money moves in the system and how private entities operate. So I. I think, I think starting with something like primary care, care, I know it's not what we all would like to see, but it is a sort of a focused campaign and it's got great people to be, to be arguing for, uh, especially, you know, families. Um, so 
I think what's going to have to happen is we're just going to have to keep chipping away at this and work at as many things as possible to keep making advances, small though they be. I, I keep thinking there's going to be some aha moment where somebody's going to you know, hear the call from up above and say, we really have to get this done. Um, it hasn't come yet, and I'm getting older, and I'd like to see this before <laughs> before I leave this earth. But um, I hope that happens. So I, yeah, I I'd, be happy, that... I'd be happy to talk with Chris, I'm, but I'm, I'm really not a healthcare expert. I, I want to say that. Um, and I know um, there were, they had a, a Zoom meeting this last week and Dr. Deb Richter was part of that. You know, yep. she's been working on this for decades. And and they have come to this conclusion that trying to get the primary care, because she said that's something everybody needs, you know, hospital care, the other aspects, um, not everybody needs, but everybody needs primary care. Right. So can I tell um, Chris that you'd, you'd be willing to talk with him? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, are, you still, are you still lobbying at the state house? No, no, I... I... I, I, the ACLU has, <clears throat> has people who are doing that. I'm not sure how active they've been in healthcare. They have their annual meeting coming up uh, in two days, by the way. Uh, you could, you know, if somebody wanted to go to that, I'm, I'm going to attend, but it's, it's virtual. Um, you could, you could uh, join it and, and see what they're talking about. I can send you the, uh, I can send you the link if you want to can yeah, I've, I've been a member for years and years, but I don't have that on my calendar. And, yeah, um, let me, uh, let me, I must still have your email, right? So um, I think so, because you probably have it from me signing up for this. Okay, okay. So what I'll do is I'll send you the, 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 uh, the URL for where you can go to register for the ACLU annual meeting. It's a short one. It's only going to be an hour long. So I, I don't know what they're going to do, but they might be going down their agenda for this coming session. Okay, is just one more question. Does Mary Alice, does she, I mean, not Mary Alice, I mean, Lila, does she still lobby or not? No, Lila is no longer working for Vermont Legal Aid. She's retired like I am. Um, she's- so, so you do stuff for the League of Women Voters. I'm sorry to be hogging this conversation, but- yeah, anyway. it's hard. It's hard to know what we're all doing now that we're not hanging out at the state house. When you hang out at the state house, you know what everybody's doing. Uh, yeah. When you don't hang out there, it's 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 a different world. Thank you so much, Alan. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah, for the work you do. Is it possible to get that link uh, for everyone in the chat? You mean the ACLU link? Yeah. Um. I would have to look it up. I don't. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me. Okay. If somebody else can start talking, so I can try to find that, I can. But um... okay. Yeah. Uh, Kate Rader has a comment that we can certainly understand how our current health system, in air quotes, um, doesn't work. I'd like to say something too. This is Mary Alice Bisbee. Um, the League of Women Voters, uh, the Vermont League of Women Voters, now has a health care committee, and we're particularly interested in in not only care of in the Vermont health care, but in national health care reform. We have a wonderful uh, League of Women Voter newsletter, and unfortunately, I'm sitting here and I don't have any links <laughs> for people. But I think Kate Rader could probably help with some of that because she's on the committee as well. Uh, and uh, we, we only have three or four people on that committee. And if you're a League of Women Voters member, you should be on the health care committee. <laughs> We'd love to have you. I, I just Googled um, ACLU and you can get the information for that meeting right there. Oh, you can. Okay, because I just found it too. But if you, but if you've got, you can it, that's register right. right there. You know. Um, okay. You can register, and it's from five thirty to six thirty on uh, Wednesday. Right. Great. Do we have any questions from anyone else, or comments? 
Uh, I have a quick question. I don't, can, can you hear me if I'm muted? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I am wondering, I, I don't know whether there's a cause and effect between the common benefit clause and the low number of Vermont constitutional amendments. You seem to suggest that, but I don't want to imagine that's what you were what you were stating. Can, can you dive a little more into that? Yeah, the process for amending the Vermont constitution is, if it's not the toughest, it's, it's just about the toughest because the legislature has to pass it twice in two different sessions before it can go to a public vote. And I, I don't think most states require the sort of the, the double review by a legislature. Um, the other thing is, I, I, I think Vermont, Vermont has had sort of, um, sort of a respect for the language that's in the constitution because it now is, I mean, it qualifies as being ancient language in, in many of the areas. And to a historian, it's just it's just this remarkable leftover uh, piece of the kind of sentiment that people who were about to fight for their independence uh, from the British, what they were thinking. Um, I mean, the Common Benefits Clause really is when you think about it, it's pretty astounding that people 250 years ago would even consider having something like that in the constitution when, I mean, they must have realized this was really all about white guys, right? Uh, there were common benefits for women. There were common benefits for enslaved people. Um, uh, so I, I I think for the most part, Vermont has escaped some of the tangling problems that lead people to want to amend their constitution all the time. Uh, we just haven't, we just haven't wanted to do that. I think people, people approach amending the constitution very, very carefully because they know it's a long and to some extent an expensive process. Um, but it is, it's, it's sort of a unique document. Um, there, there's, there's all, the, um, the right to carry a gun in Vermont is, is also the original language from the first Vermont constitution. And it was based almost word for word on the language uh, for guns in the Pennsylvania constitution. So there, it, it, it's and and the Pennsylvania Constitution has been amended for I, I forget I think there are parts of it that have been amended up to five times, um, and the Vermont Constitution has had very very few amendments. So it's uh, it's it's kind of an interesting dinosaur that's for sure. <laughs> I would like to say that uh, one of the reasons that healthcare has been stymied both nationally and 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 the state is racism it's 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 supporting something for people who are felt don't deserve it or it's giving somebody something that we have too i i it's a tough one yeah i've uh kate i've i've actually gotten questions along those lines sometimes when I've talked about this book and we get into healthcare stuff. Um, the, there certainly is a feeling that some people don't deserve adequate care because they don't listen to what their doctor says or they, um, uh, they do things that uh, put, put them at risk. And it seems to me that a doctor's professional responsibility is to uh, work with patients, even those who are recalcitrant or those who maybe don't have the ability or the financial ability or whatever to do the right kind of things in their own lives. And it, it's, really, it's really discouraging when 
highly educated um, people talk talk that way uh, that they're that they think it's okay to think some people can just sort of be thrown off the bus and we don't help them, mm -hmm. and that's that's not what Vermont is about. And I I really do believe that the that the common benefits clause in the state constitution is there to encourage people to be thinking of everyone in their community and not to, not to think that it's okay that some people are treated differently than others. Um, and somehow we've, you know, we've got to, I think we've got to, we've got to keep working at that. Betty, can you remember the name of the woman who sends out the newsletter that you've mentioned? Oh, the um, League of Women Voters newsletter? Yeah, who, who, who sends it out? Isn't it MJ Bouvier? No, 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 that's the, I mean the national, I thought you were talking about that national healthcare group newsletter. Oh, I, I wasn't. No, I, it's Mary Alice brought that up. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I'm sorry, that's what I meant. Um, it's Barbara, Barbara, and I can't think of her last name. Well, let's, In, try, let's try Barbara. Barbara in Massachusetts, <laughs> Amherst. She's from Amherst. Pearson, here we go. Yeah, Barbara Pearson. Okay. Here's the toolkit. So new. So we'll give Just it that. Just go to the toolkit, and you can check. You can check okay, everything. Not the toolkit here. Okay. Forgive my typing. <laughs> That's your typing? That's my <laughs> That sounds like it might be a, a mechanical typewriter there. <laughs> but the, the state of uh, Oregon has a good plan now, and uh, we've been studying California plan. And one thing that, uh, that uh, President Biden has said is that he would be very happy to to support state based plans. Yeah, well, he's regional a, plans. Good for him. <laughs> or even regional plans. Yeah. So well, that, you, know, that keep in mind. you know, you know, the regional thing is an interesting idea because one of the things I found was back in the 1930s. The um, <clears throat> there was a committee. What was it called? The Vermont uh, Rural Life Committee or something that actually proposed that the state provide money to each town for a, a, a town to hire a physician uh, huh. to provide services to everybody in the town. And there were a few towns that did it. Um, I think oh, wow. Stowe, I think Stowe did it for a while. I think there's somebody in the Upper Valley that did it, and then there was also Brattleboro that that took that idea, and through the hospital, the hospital essentially provided insurance plans for everybody in the town. They were covered. The hospital covered their medical needs through this. I I don't I don't know how it operated. But it was this effort that was actually successful on the local level and the town level to make sure that everybody had access to medical care. Um, mm. And some of it was some of it was the result of the um, Canadian province of Saskatchewan uh, beginning uh, to talk about the province providing medical care to everybody there. And that that actually came about in the 1950s, I think it was. That's when Tommy Douglas, who was, who was, a, who was, um, who was one of the legislative members from Saskatchewan in the Canadian parliament, that's when he led the drive in Saskatchewan to uh, bring province-wide medical care. And then within about 10 years, he also led the drive uh, in Canada to make that system that Saskatchewan had set up something that was available to everybody in all of Canada. And that's how the Canadian national health system came about. And there was a, there was a poll by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, 
I think it was back in the 1990s to it, it asked people to vote for who the uh, who who the greatest Canadian was uh, of all time historically, and Tommy Douglas was chosen as the winner for providing universal health care to. Canadians. I remember that. I remember that you too, Alan. I just wanted to, wanted to say there's just so much history that goes back, but but also remember, uh, I mean, I grew up in Waitsfield and people had to pay poll tax in order to vote. Right. And, and these are things that have gone on at the same time and it had nothing to do with racial imbalance. It had to do, and, and there was an overseer of the poor Yep. And if somebody was was poor, they were given a ticket to California or something on a bus. So this is this is the also part of our history, and it's not a part that I'm particularly proud of. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's certainly true. And it's I, I'm I, the healthcare thing is so frustrating that I'm 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 not very proud about how things. Have the last five or 10 years, I, I just don't think we've been making much uh, really significant progress. And now the question is whether <clears throat> the state retirees can be protected from Medicare Advantage. Well, the whole Medicare Advantage thing is, I, I, I can't believe that a that a not-for-profit hospital is offering plans like that. It just seems like, just seems like a conflict of interest to me. I, yes. I, I don't quite get it. Um, They're not conflicted. There's another uh, piece of that. I've been writing things to the papers about it. And if you notice the advertisements for the papers are all about UVM healthcare and uh, um, the other place over in New, in New, New York that has a, a Medicare Advantage plan. And there is a bill in Congress, and I forget, I think it's Ro Khanna out in California has a bill that um, would uh, take away the right for for-profit healthcare companies to use the word Medicare in any of their advertising. I mean, because they are not Medicare, and I think that's something that is very confusing, particularly to old people. Not to me, but to <laughs> other people. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's confusing, and it's also a come on. I mean, the, the advertisements are clearly uh, asking people to, how can you possibly turn away a, a, a system that's cheaper uh, because we were better at providing you services, and it's it might be true as long as you're healthy and don't need any care. But once you need care, you're kind of in a different ballpark, and a lot of people get disappointed. Um, and I, I just think that's that's really unjust. That that's 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 fraudulent in my mind. Um, and what the, what these insurance companies do when that happens is they deny your claims. And they tell you you have to go back to regular Medicare, and then sometimes in some most states, yeah. you cannot get a copay from your health companies because you now have pre-existing conditions. Uh, it's yeah, and it seems to me that's all that kind of stuff that Vermont tried to get rid of twenty years ago. You know, it's just somehow seeping back. Uh, <clears throat> Well, this has been this has been great. Thanks a lot to everybody who show came, came out. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, I can. You can you can go to the book website. My my address is there, as well as all the addresses and information for the bookstores. If you want to order the book, again, that the website is equalisequal.com. I was absolutely amazed that, that URL was available when I. When I <laughs> I bought it a few years ago. I thought, what? Nobody's, you know, what does this say about this country that nobody wants the URL equal is equal? <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping to hold on to that one for a while. Well, you got it now. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and thank you so much. Yes. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's and been, thank you for completing, com including healthcare in, in your book. 
Oh, and I, I wanted to say that Deb Richter is the person who I use as the introduction to the chapter on healthcare. I talk uh -huh. about all the work that she's done over the years to, to try and bring about a universal publicly financed system. It's, it's a pretty amazing story of what, what she's gone through and she's still at it. It's she's still at it. She is. Admirable. It really is. She never gives it, up. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Thank okay. you so Thank much, you very Alan. much, Ellen. Sure Thanks thing. for everybody for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Michelle. Alan, a quick question.